Hey gang, welcome back for another video here on Jochem. Okay gang, in this video, we're getting all up in talking about the bare Villiger oxidation. So if we look at this example right here, don't worry, we're gonna go through the mechanism. And then after we show how this mechanistically occurs, I wanna go through some examples. I wanna talk about everything you'll need to know to mechanistically handle this reaction as well as predicting the products and anything else that might come up with the bare Villiger oxidation. So really quickly, if we take a peek up here, we see we have a ketone. You're going to be doing this reaction with aldehydes and ketones, right? We're in carbonyl chemistry land. So what you're going to see above your reaction arrow, here I gave this specific type of peroxy acid. That's what this is right here. But you can see this in the form of R, CO3H. This you, right here, the CO3H, means you have, have a peroxy acid. It's like a carboxylic acid, but at the very end, you're going to have an oxygen. It's like you have an additional oxygen. You're going to have an OO bond right here, and that's what makes it the, a peroxy, similar to hydrogen peroxide. Okay? Just kind of wanted to point out, you know, how you can identify a bare Villiger oxidation when it's staring you in the face. And it's because you'll have a peroxy acid being treated to a ketone or an aldehyde. And what you get is you actually, uh, here we have a symmetrical carbonyl. I'm going to show you how to handle asymmetric situations. But your product is you insert an oxygen next door, you know, alpha to your carbonyl, whether that be a ketone or an aldehyde. And like I said, I'll show you how to handle the situation where you have to make a decision one side or the other. But let's step through this mechanistically first. You might see this mechanism, you know, some people draw it with fewer or more arrows, but sometimes people like to keep it real short, conveniently, um, to handle all the little acid-base reactions that can happen. What happens is you have, whoops, you have your carbonyl. Oh my goodness, I wanna draw, I actually wanna draw this HO bond. So what I'm going to do is I'm drawing the peroxy acid, but what I want you to see is the CH3 is right here. This CH3 is this CH3. This carbon attached to the oxygens is this carbon right there. Okay, so I'm gonna erase this. So what kind of happens, and you see this commonly drawn this way, this oxygen attacks the carbonyl carbon. That's an arrow you will see, but you kind of see two arrows going at once. What really kind of happens is this carbonyl oxygen, we know we've protonated that atom so many times, it goes out and it grabs H plus from the peroxy acid, you know, protonating it, making this carbonyl carbon more strongly partial positive, susceptible to nucleophilic attack. So in one arrow, if you want to draw it this way, you can show the carbonyl oxygen taking one of these electron pairs and getting protonated. Uh, what I really should do is draw this from this bond right here. And this oxygen saying, you know, if you want to draw in one step, I'm going to take these two electrons, I'm going to attack the carbonyl carbon. So we kind of get this intermediate right here, where we have the OH, and I'm kind of throwing it to the you know, top left, and then you have this whole mess over here where this oxygen is now attached to the carbonyl carbon. So we have an oxygen bonded to another oxygen, which is this oxygen, and then we have the carbonyl and then a methyl group. So I'll do carbonyl and methyl group. Okay, so kind of a big step, but really it was just a protonating, protonation and an attack. Now in this step, this is where things get a little wacky. I'm gonna show you all these arrows happening at once. So the very first thing you can think of is this oxygen swings its electrons down, it reforms the oxygen carbon double bond that we see in the product we recover, or carbonyl. At the same time, right, so you can see this oxygen is now incorporated in the chain in our product. We need to actually have that happen here. So the, mechanistically, you show that with the arrows like this. This bond remains intact. This is the bond that's going to keep this oxygen in the chain. What's weird is, and I'm going to use this word very carefully, this bond is going to migrate, okay? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But this bond actually migrates and moves from this carbon-carbon bond to this now carbon-oxygen bond. This, this move actually integrates this oxygen into the chain because this oxygen is attached here, here, and then now here. Okay, so that's what that arrow is meant for. Now we actually need to take care of the rest of this, which is actually just going to be a nice leaving group. 
So what happens is this bond comes over here. We form a double bond. We need to do something or else this carbon right here is going to break the octet rule. And what I'll even do is I'll just show this electron pair bouncing up like this. So if we then move down here, what you have, and I could have done it all in one step, but you have now your carbonyl reformed. You still have this hydrogen here, so that oxygen has a plus formal charge. Now, like I said, this bond right here from now where the carbonyl carbon is, this one right here, the next thing that's in the chain is this new oxygen that was added by the peroxy acid. And then after this oxygen, right, what's this attached to? Well, it's attached to these two carbons. So then one and two as well. And then now the last thing we have is this new, I'll draw it just like it was created. We have this right here. And what will happen to finish the reaction off is just a small acid base reaction where you grab H plus from the carbonyl. You don't, we don't really care about this anymore. And we get our pr product, which is an ester right here. I can hear my, you can hear my dog whining a little bit. Okay, gang, so this is the mechanism. The mechanism doesn't come up a whole lot, but that never hurts to know it. So what I want to do is erase this. I want to talk about migratory aptitude. Yeah, that's why I used migrate very um, carefully and specifically. I want to talk about migratory aptitude, stereochemistry with this, which don't worry, there's nothing about it. Just nothing changes. All oh, poor Miles. Uh, and then also uh, some examples to drive it home and finish off this video. So give me one second. Okay, gang, to finish this video out, I want to talk about what the heck migratory aptitude is, the stereochemistry changes or not lack thereof, uh, when you do a bare villiger oxidation, uh, when stereochemistry is present, and do these lovely examples before you are a certified bare villiger oxidation master. Okay, so migratory aptitude, what is it? So in that first example right now, when we did the mechanism, we had this lovely symmetrical carbonyl, right? It didn't matter if we inserted the oxygen on this side or this side of the carbonyl in the alpha position, right? Well, life isn't always nice and symmetrical. So that's where, in terms of the bare villiger oxidation, migratory aptitude helps you make the choice when you have an asymmetric carbonyl. So if we take a look right here, basically from this side to this side, so what this what this little list is saying is when you have an asymmetric situation, if you look on both sides, you know, if, if it's just a hydrogen, that side will more easily migrate that bond, remember? So if you have a hydrogen on one side of your carbonyl, like here, that is the side you will undoubtedly, you know, insert that oxygen. That wins out. That's the most favorable, most easily migratable uh, bond. Then it goes tertiary, and, and by tertiary, we're talking about, you know, if we look at a situation like this, if you see this carbon, you kind of ignore the carbonyl, because when you're comparing both sides, they're both bonded to the carbonyl carbon. So it's like a common, you know, substituted, you know, bond. So you just look at what the carbon is attached to. So here you would see one, two, three. Okay, this is a tertiary substituent. So that's where, so it, it's a quaternary carbon, but in terms of the migratory migratory aptitude, it's tertiary. Just want to, that can be confusing. It confused me at first as well. So then if you have a phenyl group, which is a benzene ring or secondary, those have the same migratory aptitude. Then it goes to primary and then methyl. Okay. So this list is your guide for asymmetric bare villiger oxidation. So let's, oh, and in terms of stereochemistry, if you're inserting an oxygen on that side of the molecule, don't, you don't have any stereochemistry concerns. The stereochemistry is untouched, which is why, you know, in these first three problems, let's tackle this one. I put some stereochemistry there. So you can see this carbon is chiral, right? It's attached to an ethyl group, a methyl group, this and a hydrogen. Oops. Well, so we see we have a ketone. We have our peroxy acid. This is screaming bare villiger oxidation at us. So it's at this point you'd say, okay, well, this is asymmetric. I see I have... So if we looked at this carbon right here, right, we don't count the carbonyl carbon that's attached to for migratory aptitude purposes. This carbon's only attached to one other carbon. So for migratory aptitude purposes, this is a primary carbon. And if we look over here, one, two, this is secondary. You know, we're more substituted. Secondary beats out primary. So we're going to be inserting 
the oxygen in this position right here. So our product looks as follows. There's the oxygen, and then I have two carbons on my chain. And I know that first carbon that was alpha to the carbonyl is still has that wedged ethyl group because the bare villager oxidation does not mess with stereochemistry at all, okay? And we got an ester. Now down here, I wanted to give you a different look. So because remember, you don't always have to get this specific type of peroxy acid. It can be various kinds. Here, I just gave you a generic peroxy acid. So here, if we're going to look at our migratory aptitude, because this is an asymmetric carbonyl, it's an aldehyde. Right here, we have a carbon that's bonded to one other carbon. This is primary, but it didn't even matter. Didn't even have to consult the list because right next door, we have an, a hydrogen, the most migratable uh, group we can have next to our carbonyl when doing a bare villager oxidation. This absolutely wins out. So as weird as it sounds, we don't always just get esters when we do bare villager oxidations. If I insert an oxygen over here, we actually just get a carboxylic acid, okay? So last but not least, down here. This, if you look to the left of this group right here, this is a phenyl group. So you're not, you know, the benzene ring is just right off of the carbonyl. And then over here, remember we don't count the carbonyl here. So one, two, three, this is tertiary. Consult the migratory aptitude list. And you'd see, okay, tertiary beats out phenyl. So we get an oxygen next door. And then the T-butyl group follows right here. Okay, gang, if you've had any confusion about the bare villager oxidation in terms of migratory aptitude, in terms of does it affect stereochemistry, the mechanism, I hope this may have cleared up your confusion. Make sure to check out this video. And if you're watching on YouTube, you're amazing. Thank you. Make sure to check out my actual website because they are linked to worksheets, free with answers, also for free. Um, thank you for watching, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Jochem. You're the best. Uh, and no matter what, I hope to see you all in the next video.